Energy Storage News has been reporting and offering insights, analysis and opinion on the global market for a decade. We've seen the industry grow from a handful of megawatt scale projects scattered around the world to a thriving ecosystem of projects large, small and in some cases very large indeed. We are proud to support the transition to modern, clean energy sources via smart technologies that allow us, for the first time, to have real flexibility in the electricity system. Energy Storage News is part of Solar Media, which also produces titles such as PV Tech, Current and Solar Power Portal, and hosts events including the Energy Storage Summit series. The interview you're about to see was recorded at the 2024 Energy Storage Summit EU in London. Editor Andy Colthorpe speaks with Long Duration Energy Storage Council Director of Markets and Technology, Gabe Murtar, who joined the group last year. In its own words, the trade group works to educate decision makers about the benefits of Long Duration Energy Storage, or LDES, as the council's CEO, Julia Sauda, likes to call it. Its members include providers of technologies like flow batteries, thermal energy storage, advanced compressed air, and many more, alongside service providers and potential end users like Microsoft and Google. One thing that really uh, interested me about your, I guess you could call it personal journey, Gabe, is that most recently you are with Kaiso, which is the, the main wholesale market and, and grid operator in California which is the leading market in solar, which led to it being the leading market in energy storage. And from there, a leading market in kind of the increasing durations of storage, especially paired with, but not exclusively, um, with solar. So Gabe, yeah, so what kind of took you from Kaiso into this kind of long duration energy storage space? And, and I don't know if there's anything you can say about the direction that California was going that kind of, you know, informed your decision to, to kind of make this jump, or, or perhaps they're completely sim separate. I'll, I'll let you uh, mm -hmm. guide us on that. Yeah, I think, I think it definitely did, and I think you've hit on some of the key elements there. Um, obviously, one of the things that originally enticed me to go to California was just thinking about how far they were along in terms of decarbonization and thinking about being a little bit kinder to the planet. Mm -hmm. um, so just, just kind of being aligned with those beliefs got me to California in the first place. Being involved in storage, which is what I was doing for California for the last five years, um, including developing their grid participation models for storage resources, really shined a spotlight on how important this stuff is and why it's critical for decarbonization. And I think the next step in that journey is exactly like you just pointed out. We need to transition from thinking about building short duration storage resources, getting those on the system, to thinking about building multiple different levels of duration. So durations of four hours, um, like we've got a lot of today, durations of 10 hours to do more of that intraday energy movement, and then durations even beyond that. So thinking eventually about seasonal durations. Mm -hmm. How do we move energy from a relatively abundant time like the spring and the fall and get that energy to you know, the winter and the summer when we have peak critical needs on the system? That's where we're going. And it, it, it's a really exciting space. So very fun to work in and uh, definitely keeps me busy. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, what's I find really interesting that we're talking here in the, in the UK about this subject is that there is a consultation happening at the moment on how the UK will treat long duration mm -hmm. energy storage. Um, but I'm going to be a complete nerd and just go to one detail within that. And that, that's that the, I believe the definition uh, on this side of the pond is long duration being six hours duration or more. Whereas, and I appreciate this isn't a market defining sort of definition, but it's the one that is being leaned on by the US Department of Energy is I believe something from 10 hours or 10 hours plus up to 100 hours and beyond which you kind of go more towards like a seasonal sort of outlook. So I guess this might be a question more for the uninitiated, but what do you think the discrepancy is in those definitions? And I guess it kind of speaks to a little bit the nascency of, of you know, how not necessarily the technologies, but how we consider them in a market-based context? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it absolutely does. And I think whether you say, hey, the threshold is six hours or the threshold is 10 hours, we know that there's a difference between the, the resources that are being built and 
to, you know, Im implemented and integrated onto grids today, and the resources we're going to have being integrated onto grids as we continue to decarbonize. Those longer durations are absolutely necessary, and all the data, all of the like the detailed modeling and the studying shows that they're needed. I think what really generates that that cutoff period is a question about cost, hmm. because once you are studying lithium-ion resources the cost is basically linear. So as you increase in duration, the, those costs go up linearly. If you're talking about other long duration energy storage solutions, those costs don't increase in the same way. So once you get to about that six hour, the 10 hour duration, you're at about parity between some of the technologies that are out there for other long duration energy storage resources that aren't lithium ion and lithium ion resources. And once you get much beyond that threshold, um, the, the, the data is pretty clear that lithium ion is probably not what you're gonna have as a solution when you do start building out those longer duration resources. But again, what we'd like to see is solicitations for these resources once the targets are put up, put in place by governments and regulators. So yeah, so not not to keep bringing you back to the the California market and and you know the questions around that, but I think what a lot of people found really interesting uh, over the last couple of years is that we have had the first competitive solicitations mm -hmm specifically for long duration storage, but long duration in this case defined as eight, eight hours, I believe. Uh, do correct me if I get any of this wrong, obviously, I appreciate it. But I think what we found really interesting is that so far those solicitations have in fact yielded, yeah, lith contracts for lithium ion um, storage, you know, and, and there's various conversations I've had around that with some of the people doing the procurements that they say, you know, listen, we are definitely open to non-lithium mm -hmm. technologies. Mm -hmm. It's just that at this point, that seemed to be what best fitted what the needs were in our solicitations. So, yeah, just wondering if that's something you kind of got an eye on and, and kind of how, how you might sort of maybe demystify that question a little bit for, for some of the audience. So, yeah, I think, I think for some of our audience that may not know, um, the process to, to get a project approved, um, and, and now we're not talking about um, what, like a project that's going to be funded by the government or like a beta project or a test project or something like that. Mm -hmm. We're talking about grid scale, potentially 100 plus megawatt projects, so very large um, applications here. The, the, the process is lengthy, right? You're going to go out and your utility is first going to make a call for bids for the process. For, for the specific project to meet the need that they have. Um, so let's say a uh, utility is trying to procure 100 megawatts of 10 hour duration storage. Um, they're gonna look for any provider that can, that, that can serve and meet that need. Now, um, this could be a lithium ion resource. They can certainly provide 10 hours of duration. It could be a long duration energy store, another long duration energy storage technology. Um, and there's a whole uh, bevy of those resources out there. But then the utility is gonna take all those bids back and they're gonna review all those bids. And one of the one of the criteria is obviously gonna be cost, but they're also gonna be looking at other criteria. Um, how far along are these technologies? Um, how much business have they done with the developer in the past? Um, you know, what, what kind of confidence do they have that this project is going to be delivered on time? You hear a lot about like interconnection issues. You hear a lot about, um, you, you know, supply chain issues. How confident do they feel about anybody who's submitting a bid to, to actually meet those goals? So it's not just a matter of cost. It, it tends to be a whole array of things. And you're absolutely right. Lithium ion is a technology that's been, been built. It's been proven. Um, it works. It, it can interconnect to the grid. Um, it can provide grid services. Um, and a lot of these other long duration energy storage technologies are a little bit newer. Um, so it's going to take a little while for them to, to kind of get to the same point in these competitive processes. Sure. I mean, I think one thing I hear a little bit from some of the system integrators um, mm -hmm. that work with lithium ion um, is that, you know, they are looking with real interest at a lot of the long duration energy storage technologies. Mm -hmm. But to some extent, they don't just need to compete with lithium ion, but they need to go beyond what you might expect to find from from lithium iron i guess i'm partially quoting someone else's words but you know there's a quite a dive i think the the point is that there's quite a diverse set of technologies within the long duration energy storage councils mm -hmm. um even just in the membership and i, I guess you know there are new technologies coming out all the time so 
what are some of the things about some of those exciting technologies that you know you're starting to see that will lead it to maybe be a complement to lithium ion in some mm -hmm. respects, but also give advantages over lithium ion, I think, mm -hmm. that potentially, you know, will help it to scale, I guess. Yeah, and, I, and, and just to kind of go back to your last question, um, you know, there are some of those procurement requirements in California were met by alternatives to lithium ion. Sure. So there, there certainly have been some contracts signed for non-lithium ion, and we'll see those on the grid in just a few years in, in pretty large quantities, which is super exciting. Um, there are some things that just, you know, distinguish um, some of the other LDES uh, solutions from lithium ion. Um, obviously, uh, you know, I, I think one of the biggest factors um, could be, you know, an ability to provide inertia. You know, does some of the long duration energy storage solutions, not all, but some of them have rotating mass. And if you've got rotating mass, you can obviously provide actual inertia. Um, there's been a lot of discussions around synthetic inertia because we do have quite a lot of PV that's being built in grids around the world, quite a lot of storage resources. Um, so if you do have something like synthetic inertia, that could be a product um, that takes off in the future. But inertia is, is one of the key characteristics um, that distinguishes some of the LDS technologies from others. Obviously, um, there's others. Uh, there's things like fire risk. Uh, people talk a lot about that, and, and there are some concerns there, uh, particularly in certain parts of uh, the world around fire risk. And then um, obviously, you know, cost is one of the things that for those very long durations, um, you're going to see some of these potential technologies be quite competitive, uh, far superior even to uh, some of the conventional technologies that we've got in our system today. Sure. I mean, coincidentally, I was just speaking with one of the LDES council members um, from Energy Dome. Terrific. I was saying that, yeah, absolutely. The just the inertia portion of, mm -hmm. of the you know the the applications is something that they can do through their technology because it has essentially turbine driven electricity mm -hmm. rather than inverter based um, generation you know connected to inverter based um, operation. Um, in terms of the Elders Council, you know I think a lot of us are, are really familiar with uh, the executive director Julia Salda has done. Uh, phenomenal work, I think, you know, from originally being part of the California long duration uh, storage efforts and then right. know, into yeah. the, the Elders Council. So, um, but from your point of view, you know, you're a uh, markets and policy director, I want to say. Markets and technology. Markets yes. and technology director. Okay. <laughs> but, Edit but that bit a, out, please. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, but, okay. it, but it is, yeah. it does overlap with policy quite sure, a bit. Sure. So, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Coming from that, Gabe, like, what's your role now with Elders Council? Um, and kind of, you know, let's focus on short-term objectives. Yeah. What do you want to see achieved? And, and, you know, how is Elders Council helping to do that, I guess? Yeah, I spend a lot of time thinking about research questions. So, you know, why do you need long-duration energy storage? Um, e even taking a step back, thinking about just how do we decarbonize? How do we actually do it? Um, what are the resource mixes that we need? What are the biggest bottle, bottlenecks and constraints that we have? Mm -hmm. How much money does it save you if you're thinking about including long duration energy storage resources in your mix compared to not including those? There's been some re research done out there. Um, there hasn't been enough research though. We certainly haven't investigated every single you know, utilities footprint to ensure that they're decarbonizing at the least cost manner possible. Um, and that's ultimately where we want to get to um, beca because the goal here is decarbonization. It's not just, hey, you need to develop long duration energy storage. That's a means to the end. Um, so we're thinking a lot about that. I've also been thinking and, and spending a lot of time um, working on industrial decarbonization. Okay. Um, there's a lot of synergies between the electricity industry and industry. And frankly, that's another area that there just hasn't been enough energy um, and, and enough ink spilled on. And I think making sure that the regulators and making sure the people who are thinking about policy know that there's some big synergies that we could gain here um, could be really important and could ultimately save ratepayers um, and governments a lot of money in this goal for decarbonization. Okay, and, and in terms of synergies, do you mean in the opportunities for sector coupling being part of that? Or Absolutely. Is it yeah. broader or...? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think sector, sector coupling is, is certainly a broad term. Uh, but what I think about is if, if, you know, if I've got an application that uses um, 
you know, low temperature heat. So I'm thinking about 100 degrees centigrade to maybe 400 or 500 degrees centigrade. So uh, chemical manufacturing, food and beverage industry, um, th those kind of applications, you may need heat 24 by 7, and you may need the same same temperature heat, you know, uh, for, for your operations of your plant. Um, and to get that today, what most resources are doing is is burning natural gas to get there. And maybe you've got like a, a, a carbon tax or something that you pay, uh, or, or you're accounting for that carbon in some other way, or maybe you're not, which is even worse. Mm -hmm. um, but But using potentially thermal energy storage and connecting that directly with the electricity grid, which is also becoming decarbonized, could completely um, unburden your system um, from burning that natural gas. And then you've also got the flexibility of a thermal energy storage resource there where it could, you know, just, just like a generator, be operated by the grid and, and directed to either consume energy or not consume energy at the will of the grid operator, um, which allows for a lot more flexibility when you do have a system with a lot of variable resources like wind and solar. Sure, sure. And maybe this is more a question for some of the actual technology providers that are out there trying mm -hmm. to sell this stuff. But when you're presenting that to, to you know, to an industrial customer, like what, what's the, the right way to kind of present that so that it's a, a you know, essentially de-risk to the point that they're comfortable mm -hmm. with, scalable to the point that they can use and kind of, you know, at the same time cost effective. I mean, I wonder if it's a little bit analogous to, you know, corporate renewables it used to be quite a hard sell as far mm -hmm. as I understand. And now, you know, there's a Bloomberg NEF report from a week or two ago that, you know, corporate procurement is just going through the roof. And, you know, privately, I might worry that maybe that's all just to feed data centers for, for Bitcoin or what mm -hmm. have you. But that's just my own, you know, that's a whole separate thing, I guess, in its own right. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of that, you know, how, how does that kind of value proposition of, of long duration energy storage being presented to industrial entities in a way that they can understand and, and you know, and, and ultimately make decisions on investment, I guess. Yeah, I, th I think it's the same sort of story where, you know, it, it's going to take a few case examples early on and, and early adopters to say, yes, I want to do this because it's the right thing to do. And, and frankly, the economics are there for some applications, not necessarily for all, um, particularly applications where natural gas prices are high or um, if you're decarbonizing things that are off grid already and maybe you're like trucking in diesel, which is extremely expensive, um, you can completely decarbonize those applications and the new infrastructure, the new build out of resources, solar, wind plus storage, including long duration energy storage to keep your operations open 24 by seven is more cost effective than, than some of those high diesel costs and the, and the shipping costs for diesel. Um, yeah, and, and the same thing. If you've got high carbon taxes, if you've got high natural gas costs, that can also just make the cost work out. Uh, but I think exactly like you say, uh, relatively new technologies. I think companies are uh, a little bit leery just, just in general. And then you've got infrastructure, like if, if you've just put in a new um, natural gas fired boiler or something within the last two years, you're probably not looking to retrofit that or, or completely right. move away from that. Yeah. Today, uh, maybe that's something you do in 10 years or 15 years at the end of the useful life of that asset. This is starting to happen, um, and you are starting to see these technologies evolving. I think from the Eldez Council's standpoint, we are dealing with the regulators and thinking about policies that can make these more favorable. We're certainly making arguments about how helpful this can be for decarbonization and, and you know, what policy levers you can pull. You know, think about those carbon taxes, um, may, maybe think about you know, a, a timeline for a blanket ban on just natural gas fired boilers in general and, and what, what that can do in terms of your decarbonization numbers. And then obviously, like we were just talking about, some of the benefits to the electricity grid might need to be factored in by governments as well. Okay, okay. I mean, I think we've probably uh, come to wrap up um, shortly, sure. but I guess since we're here at the Energy Storage Summit in London and it's the Energy Storage Summit EU as well. So there's mm -hmm. a kind of twin market focus, I guess, um, for being here. So I don't know how much time you spend looking at those specific markets. So perhaps I'll just ask you in you know in more general terms, in terms of the geographies and markets you're looking at. But mm -hmm. yeah, your observations, I guess, from from being here, you know, 
in London, kind of looking at it from a perspective that's, you know, maybe slightly different to what you've been working on day to day mm -hmm. to, to some, some time. Yeah, what's your impressions on, on that? I, I, you know, it's really fun to be here. Um, so many people are interested in you know, the, the different technologies that are here. Um, you're, you're having some great hallway conversations, just bumping into people who uh, maybe you're meeting for the first time uh, that you've only seen on Zoom calls. Um, that sounds familiar. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's the age we live in. Um, but, but they're, you know, j just coming in, you could feel the energy and people are excited about this. We know the money's behind this. Um, this is an extremely rapidly evolving area industry. Um, so people want to be here, uh, which is super exciting. It makes our work fun. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. It's always nice when work can be fun, isn't right? it? Right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Okay, Gabe. Well, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Um, and I, I know our readers will really appreciate yeah. uh, the value of your experience and insights. And yeah, I look forward to uh, continuing to hear from the Elders Council and, of course, its constituent members over the coming years. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure.